Welcome everyone to our latest edition of our NCAA Social Series. I'm Andy Katz. Pleased to be joined by three esteemed guests here that are going to cover a topic that is, of course, uh, well known to all of us, and that is COVID-19 and this next phase that we're in with the Delta variant as we prepare for the fall semester, fall quarter in intercollegiate athletics. So you know, NCAA Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Brian Hainline to my lower left on this screen from my vantage point. And then down from Louisiana, Dr. Katie O'Neill. She is the Assistant Professor of Medicine in the section of Infectious Diseases at LSU Health, New Orleans School of Medicine's branch campus in Baton Rouge. And a critical voice, not just at LSU, but certainly in the SEC. And her husband, Dr. Bud O'Neill, the Associate, Pro excuse me, Associate Professor of Medicine, Pulmonary and Critical Care at LSU Health Sciences Center about the evolving COVID-19 landscape. We're gonna to get to him uh, and, and the new guidelines uh, that have now just been released this week for fall participation. Uh, Dr. O'Neill, I wanna start with you about um, not just in the state of Louisiana, obviously, but just nationally, where we are right now with COVID-19 and the Delta variant. So, um where we are, and I'm going to I'm going to go. Even though there's two Dr. O'Neills on this call, I think that you're pitching it to me first. So thank you so much. Um, that where we are today is an interesting place. It's actually a place in Louisiana that we haven't found ourselves in before, and that is our highest hospitalization rate that we've ever seen in this pandemic, eclipsing uh, April of 2020. When and at that point we thought we were on fire, so a new level and 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 still coming. I heard one of Bud's partners yesterday, another critical care physician, say, "I think that patients are falling from the sky, and that's what it does feel like. We're admitting one COVID patient every 45 minutes." Um, where we are nationally, we're seeing at least in the South that that's occurring everywhere. Hospitals are at capacity throughout the SEC. And then that growth is happening even in places that are better vaccinated than the South. Anybody who is unvaccinated is at risk of developing severe COVID-19 and spreading it to many people. Not uh, a good place to be. For these purposes, if it's okay, um, because we have two O'Neills here, uh, if you're okay, uh, Katie, Bud, Yep. And of course, Brian, if everyone's okay with that, I just want to respect that uh, because your titles obviously are, are tremendous. Um, so I just want to follow back up with you, Katie, because you've been pretty direct, which I think you needed to be. Um, and I think people needed to hear that pretty much we're in a position where if, you, if you're either vaccinated or you are not vaccinated, in other words, you're either possibly not going to get COVID or you're going to get COVID. Uh, that it's pretty stark right now. Um, I think you made that statement a couple of weeks ago. How true is that even this week? It's very true. And I'm going to let Bud in a little bit read off some of the years of birth of the people in his ICU today, because it, it's a, just an, an incredible thing to see the people at risk from, from COVID-19 and from the Delta variant. But, um, but at this point, everybody's going to get it. It's, it's spreading so incredibly fast in communities. And it is so contagious compared to last year's variant, um, as contagious as the chicken pox. And for those of us who got the chicken pox when we were kids, that thing spreads like wildfire. And so at this point, it's not, a, it's not an if, it's a when. And if you're unvaccinated, you put yourself at incredible risk. And you've also put the people around you at risk because you're going to spread it to more people as an unvaccinated person. Um, and so really, there are only two decisions. Do I want to take that incredible risk and contribute to the pandemic? Or do I want to get vaccinated and help this thing stop? And we're just, I'm sorry, when you say everyone's going to get it, you think everyone in some form, even if you're vaccinated or are you just talking about the unvaccinated? Well, so as a virus, we're going to become exposed. You know, you, all the colds that you got when you were little, you get them again and again, right? But some you don't get sick from anymore because you have antibodies. So I expect to see COVID-19 over and over again over the next several weeks to months. Um, I know that I saw it many times today protected, hopefully, um, but everybody's going to be exposed. That's where breakthrough cases come in. So as a vaccinated individual, if my antibody level is really low, if I'm older, if I'm receiving chemotherapy, I again become somebody at risk. So Bud, uh, Katie referenced this, um, this particular week, uh, how bad is it in the ICU in terms of uh, the age ranges? Yeah, it, it's, it's been interesting what, what we've seen here, and it's sad. So if you look at our ICU in the hospital that I'm currently at right now, this, high, this, this hospital has, if you were to walk into it and, and go to the room that you would call an ICU, uh, we typically have 32 beds. Uh, right now, we have 57 COVID patients in the ICU. 
So just the COVID patients alone are occupying over twice as many ICU beds as we typically have. And one of the things that, that we've seen is that these patients are much younger than they were a year ago. Uh, a year ago, it was predominantly a disease of the elderly, of the institutionalized patients, be they nursing homes uh, in prisons. Now we're seeing a much younger population. In fact, the median age uh, of our ICU admits is around 52 years old, meaning half of the patients in our ICU are below the age of 52. And so when you start looking at the years of birth of patients, when I start seeing every other patient being born in 1970 or after, uh, that really begins to hit home because these are otherwise young. These are people who should be with their kids, uh, you know, doing at work, doing things, but they're in my ICU. And I can tell you, so we have currently, and this is, this is just real time data. Uh, this is looking at patients who were admitted in the last 24 hours. Many of them are still in our emergency department because we don't have enough ICU beds for them. Uh, but right now there are seven of them and these are their years of birth. And it's striking 1944, 1981, 1998, 2000, 1983, 1953, and 1973. These people should not be in the ICU. Um, and, and so nobody is safe from this. You can't say, no longer can you say, well, I'm, I'm young and healthy, I'm not going to get this. We have people in our ICU that, that are athletes. We have people in our ICU that are 40 years old and they participate in triathlons and they are sick. Um, what I tell people and, and people ask about the breakthrough cases, I tell them, you know, the, the, the vaccine, it's like wearing a bulletproof vest. Uh, it doesn't prevent you from being shot. Uh, what it does is when you get shot, it, it hopefully prevents it from hurting you really bad. And, uh, and it could still hurt you. You could still break some ribs. It just hopefully won't penetrate the vest. Uh, it, it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. And what you want is when you go into a battle, when you go into a gunfight, you would rather be wearing a bulletproof vest than not. And, and I'll tell you, we're in a gunfight and we're going to be in this gunfight for a long, long time. And we're going to take a lot of bullets. It's going to be impossible to dodge them all. And so, you know, you know, we ask people just wear, wear, wear your bulletproof vest, uh, add all the Kevlar you can, because you're going to get hit. Uh, one quick thing before I get to you, Brian, about the, the new guidelines for the fall. Um, Katie, we've seen in other countries, uh, you know, whether it's India, the UK, that have really gone through this. And it's, been, you know, horrendous in Indi India, um, different times in the UK. What are the chances by sort of the meat of the fall, whether that's late September, October, that this surge of Delta uh, might be at least coming down uh, to at least maybe a, a little bit more manageable in different parts of the country. We are, uh, we're totally in control of that. Um, I'm gonna use a sports phrase because I hear it all the time on Saturdays. Um, we're in control of our own destiny, right? So the chances of it coming down are, are in our hands now. In previous surges, uh, governments have, have mitigated for us, mask mandates, uh, restaurant capacity, stadium capacity, which I just don't want to see again. Um, if we don't want that, because that is really the only thing that's gotten other surges down, then we will have to vaccinate. And for many, as in Louisiana, we'll have to wear masks for a little while while people catch up on their vaccines. If we don't get there, the surge could last for a much longer period of time. And what we saw in those other countries that you're talking about is they, they instituted mitigation again to get their surge down. And in England, they were better vaccinated than we were, still with a very high surge, but able to control it. So it, we need to do our own mitigation and take this pandemic back you know, into our own control and get vaccinated today. So Brian, let's go over the new guidelines. Um, I'm sure you had to rewrite them over the last couple of weeks because uh, as I've said many times on this show, uh, I'm a father of a college rising sophomore uh, at Northwestern and Northwestern now just has reversed and instituted at least initially in August, a mask mandate for the time being. Um, and it is mandatory that everyone gets vaccinated like it is at a number of different schools across the country, some private, some public, uh, that you can't even step foot on campus as a student, student athlete, faculty, staff, even media personnel, unless you are vaccinated. And obviously that is situational, that is regional, that is sometimes private versus public. As you deal with athletics, Brian, what are the new guardrails vaccinated versus unvaccinated? Yeah, so Andy, we did send out our, our, our new guidance to the membership this week. We sent out version 52. 
Um, and, and, you know, just to, as a, to tell you how many times we had to rewrite that. And, and just to backtrack a little bit, when I say we, this is with the COVID-19 medical advisory group, the Autonomy 5 medical advisory group, and then a working group from the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. And then we run it by other groups like the SEC conference and, and, and so forth. And so everyone came to an agreement that there's really a huge demarcation in this guidance. It's the vaccinated and it's the unvaccinated. We no longer categorize sport according to risk of transmission. So we're not differentiating football, for example, from, from fall tennis. We're really, and we, we aren't even talking now about um, herd immunity. We're just saying, look, we're at such a level of, of sustained and substantial or high transmission, essentially throughout almost all the country. And because we know that, you know, even vaccinated individuals, they may carry the virus, even though they're highly protected uh, against uh, severe complications and, and hospitalization, that we essentially said, we're not talking about herd immunity. We're just talking about the fact that we have the Delta virus right now and we have vaccinated or unvaccinated individuals. And the unvaccinated individuals, we, we are stating in the document, we're recommending as a guidance, so this isn't a mandate, uh, that they undergo surveillance testing on a very regular basis. That when they when they arrive on campus, that they get tested. They don't allow to they aren't allowed to participate in athletics until they test negative. For the vaccinated, on the other hand, we are testing, but if they're symptomatic or if really looked at a, in an analysis of a close contact, then we believe there's a risk there that they may be tested at that point in time as well. The quarantine differs from the uh, fully vaccinated from the unvaccinated. And, and we state in the document from a guidance point of view, really, if you're unvaccinated, you should be masked at all times. You should be distanced at all times. We're in a different reality right now. And yes, that's hard to swallow. It, it's hard to accept that when, you know, it just seems three or four weeks ago that we were in a place of freedom and, 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 and the war was, was almost over. But but the enemy, if you will, has transformed and it, it's mutated it, and it's come back to, to really deliver a, a, a full punch to us. And, you know, as Bud said, we, we have to be properly armored. So in the document, we're unequivocal about the benefit of vaccination. And we even state if you've had an infection before, um, you know, in, in accordance with CDC guidance and when it makes sense, you should be vaccinated as well. So that's the push. There's a differential and we're just urging everyone to be vaccinated. So Katie and Bud, uh, this is pretty clear and this mirrors society right now and certainly in professional sports that you know the NFL has come out very strongly on this topic that basically you're gonna have two different locker rooms almost. Those that are vaccinated, those that are unvaccinated. Those that are vaccinated are not gonna have to be tested unless they're symptomatic. Those that are unvaccinated, testing, masking, distancing, all that is occurring. And at SEC Media Day a couple of weeks ago, and I'm hoping it has changed since then, but SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey was pretty direct as well that only six out of 14 at that time in mid-July had reached a threshold of, of, of vaccine. I think it was around 80%, um, which was uh, you know a number that obviously needed to come to, to get higher. What are your thoughts? Because you're there in SEC country, Katie and Bud, of, of basically two tracks of people here on the student athlete front where there's going to be different treatment for both based on vaccination. I mean, I think it's, I think it's absolutely needed. And, and um, you know, as we watch our, our friend groups play out and our colleagues play out in this pandemic. And then as we watch outbreaks play out, um, you, you're seeing that divide everywhere of the vaccinated are starting to realize I'm, I'm not protected. I thought it was going away. I thought I was going to be okay, but now I know somebody who looks and, and is my age, looks like me and is my age, and, and they're in the hospital. And so we are seeing an, a renewed interest in vaccination, um, and, and we're seeing that in our colleges too. So I think even though Media Day seems like it was just the other day, uh, we have just been able to offer a ton more education on what this Delta variant is to college athletes. And obviously before Media Days, we weren't really talking about it. So that has made a big difference in people's decision. And I think in our community, we're seeing the same thing. But yeah, so, you know, I think when you look at our community, uh, and I can tell you what we see here in Baton Rouge is that in the three largest hospitals in Baton Rouge, there are about 380 total uh, COVID positive patients in the hospital, about 
12 to 15 percent of those at any given time are vaccinated. Um, and, and so really the, the vaccinated people who make it to the to the hospital uh, really represent the minority of those patients. There aren't near as many of those patients that are, as there are unvaccinated. The other thing that we see is that I see as an ICU doctor is it is despite that, it is rare that a vaccinated patient makes it to the ICU. So even when a vaccinated patient ends up in the hospital, they are less sick than the unvaccinated patients who come in. Um, the other thing, and, and we've looked at this too, is that the vaccinated population, when they come into the emergency department, if they are ultimately diagnosed, they are more likely to go home. The ones who are admitted tend to be older and sicker anyway. And so it does provide a tremendous amount of protection for individuals. And I think it only makes sense that um, when you're when you're doing things in competition, when you're doing things in close quarters, like athletes often do, that you have to treat the vaccinated differently than the unvaccinated. It they are medically, uh, scientifically, they are two different populations, and they they require two different forms of mitigation uh, for how this is for how this is going to play out. I think it I think it just makes sense not only in the world of athletics but also in the public as well. And so another narrative, and it, I'll start with you, Brian. If we can go around our, our Zoom room here is there's now a different attitude when it comes to scheduling. And Greg Sankey, the SEC commissioner, was really the first one, and now we've seen it almost universal from every commissioner at these football media days, where everyone's done. Like, we're done rescheduling and trying to, trying to get everything fit in. If your team cannot participate because you had an outbreak, in large part because you did not have enough people vaccinated, that's on you. That's a forfeit. And in the NFL, they're pretty clear that players aren't going to even get paid in those kind of situations. But in the college space, we're not going to sort of redo everything to make it fit your needs. If you didn't get it done, it's a forfeit. We move on. We cannot continue to try to sort of make everything happen to fit your schedule. The vaccinated population is like, look, we've done our part. So, Brian, start with you about the way the leadership we've seen now at all levels of the college space have now taken to the point where we're changing the narrative here. We're moving on. We're dealing with the virus, especially hoping that you've been vaccinated. Yeah, so Andy, if we go back to a year ago when we put out our developing standards for practice and competition document that became a Board of Governors mandate, we were at this unimaginable place of 70,000 new infections a day. And we're right back there and more. Um, but the difference a year ago, we were still trying to figure out what worked there wasn't a blame. There was, a, there was really a, a tremendous amount of empathy and sympathy for, for those who became sick. And, you know, we were learning on the ground, but now we know a lot. We know the vaccine works. And, and this whole idea of personal liberty versus, you know, what's good for the public health, what's good for the team, what's good for the conference, those, those conversations have changed. And I think as expressed by, by Greg Sankey and, and others and by the NFL and, and essentially it's what's in our resocialization document, there's a clear choice right now. And the clear choice is vaccinations work. Vaccinations are really going to help to mitigate what's going on. And vaccinations are the best chance for your team to be able to compete. And if you're not vaccinated, well, that's a choice. And that's a choice that's going to infringe on really the liberty of your team to compete and, and the liberty of the conference to be able to move on ahead and with its schedule. So yeah, hard line really makes a lot of sense right now. Katie? The same thing, you know, just a nuance to that is that in this population that we're talking about, a team trying to make it through a season, this is really a preventable disease. We, we talked about breakthroughs. They're in the elderly, they're in the infirm, they're in people who are receiving chemo. Um, but this is a preventable disease within college athletics. And so if you have great prevention, probably one of the best things we've ever had to prevent a disease um, and, and you can't, you can't make it to the game. It, it was your choice. And, and as Brian said, this is a team sport, just like you make a playbook and you run through it. There's, we've added something to the playbook. If you choose not to add it, you may not make it. You know, but I, I want to do a little myth, bust, myth busting here. Um, you know, it seemed like there were times when if athletes held out, it was, well, I don't want to miss a, a training day. You know, what if I'm sick for two days? How is that going to affect me in competition or practice or my whole routine? Um, when you would hear things like that or stuff like that in the public space of, of a high, you know, elite athlete choosing not to do it because of fear of what's going in his body when that's a whole nother topic of, you know, any kind of performance enhancing uh, drug or anything like that, but 
in this case, how do you handle those kinds of narratives mm -hmm. where athletes might have been reluctant because it might sideline them for just a little bit? Yeah, I, I think that, that there, are, there are a couple of ways to do it. I think one is through education of the science. Um, you, you know, the virus, the, the coronavirus is, is a complex uh, machine. It's a complex virus. Uh, and, and the vaccine is relatively simple when you look at it overall. And so the, 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 the vaccines only contain a component of what the coronavirus really, uh, coronavirus really is. Um, and so, you know, the question is, do you want to be infected with the whole virus that has this complex machinery and really hijacks your cells uh, and kills them as it's replicating? Or uh, do you actually want to be, you know, have an injection of something that's a much simpler and much, much, you know, much more direct mechanism of preventing that infection? The other thing is, I think you just look at the numbers. Uh, you, you know, the Big Ten did a good job of, of looking at uh, looking at patients who were infected or, or athletes who were infected uh, with with um, with coronavirus and, and found rates uh, of rates of things something like myocarditis that are measured on the order of uh, cases per hundred or thousand. Okay, when you look at the vaccine, and one of the one of the common questions that I get as a pulmonologist when when people are asking me if they should get vaccinated, one of the common things that the young people are asking is. Well, I don't want, you know, I'm worried about this myocarditis issue that comes up with the vaccinations. And I tell them, well, if, if the cases for, or for a true coronavirus infection for COVID are measured in cases per hundred or thousand, uh, cases of myocarditis with the vaccination are measured in cases per million. Okay, so, so the denominator is completely different. It's a thousand times different. You are a thousand times less likely to get a case of myocarditis with the vaccine than you are with the virus itself. And so the question is, where do you, where, what chance do you want to take? Uh, you know, we sports and athletes, we understand that it's all about risk and it's all about probability of success. Um, and I would put my probability uh, with the vaccination. And then the other thing that I, that I tell them is in those cases, even in the highest risk population where the, the risk of myocarditis might be something like 40 cases, 50 cases per million uh, in those that do get myocarditis. At worst, it tends to be a very brief illness that lasts a couple of days for which you might take something like ibuprofen and you feel better. Sure, there are going to be some, some severe cases, but those are going to be the one per million, one per 10 million cases that happen. And so really the science plays out on your side and the statistics and probabilities play out on the side of vaccination in this. And so I just can't come up with a downside uh, to vaccination uh, when you compare it to, uh, when you compare it to the, the coronavirus infection, the COVID infection itself. Katie, uh, at the end of this month, um, football stadiums across the country are going to be packed. Every school that I can think of has already said full capacity. They're selling tickets um, amid this crisis. Uh, so what is your advice to universities uh, as they embark on filling stadiums with 70 to 100,000 people? Uh, my advice today is that if you're in an area of high transmission, that while you may have sold those tickets and you may be planning on a great football season for everybody, if you want to see that through, you need to make just as tight a game plan as Coach O is making right now for that first game, right? The community needs to be making a game plan that includes vaccination and masking in Louisiana because our high transmission rate. The only way that we'll sit in that stadium in September is if all of us together get on our own game plan. And, and honestly, I, I think our community is doing a great job. We all want to sit in Tiger Stadium from an LSU perspective. I know that the SEC all wants to be in their stadiums, but we need to follow the game plan. Vaccinate today. We'll be fully vaccinated for our first games. Uh, Brian, the masking issue, um, you know, I, I, and look at the unvaccinated versus vaccinated. Uh, how should the unvaccinated versus vaccinated handle masking on campus uh, they may have no choice depending on what the campus is doing, but let's say hypothetically if their campus is not or does not have a mask mandate, so it is open to the student athlete, what should they do? You know, part of it is a, a, a choice where you have to really think about what you're doing for yourself and for the public good. If you're unvaccinated, quite frankly, and you're in a public place, it just makes all the sense in the world right now to be masked. I know that's a hard thing to say and, and, and a harder thing to accept. Um, but that's the reality in terms of when, when, when we look at the numbers and, and the community spread. And even the vaccinated and the CDC has said this, when we're in large areas and we don't really know the, the percentage of unvaccinated individuals or when we're indoors and, uh, and, and public spaces indoors, that it makes sense to be masked because you're actually doing uh, two things. You're, you're 
helping to prevent the fact that you know you may become infected you're less likely to but more importantly you're you're helping to mitigate against spreading um this condition unwittingly to someone who's unvaccinated so so really the 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 discussions are going toward masking makes a lot of sense right now. And we just have to get back into that mindset. This, you know, as Katie said, that's what happened in India. That's what happened in Britain. And, you know, we have this almost fantasy, well, Delta is just going to pass through this country because it went so quickly through India and Great Britain. Well, it's not unless we take specific measures. And, you know, besides vaccination, the other is masking and, and using really great common sense with regard to masking. The other issue that was so prevalent last year for a number of reasons, but certainly in dealing with COVID uh, was the mental health aspect. And student athletes were incredible stress as well as students, as I spoke of. I mean, I know I dealt with this, you know, with students at Northwestern, um, but for student athletes, they were completely isolated. The only people they were around were their teammates. Uh, there was no socialization. So especially if they were newcomers, uh, it was a completely different experience on a college campus. And then if they got COVID or were contact traced, there was the isolation that, with that and knowing that maybe their team was missing games and there was so much with that. Um, so I wanna to get to that in a second, but I'm just curious, the two of you, uh, Katie and Bud, you're dealing with this 24 seven um, and you're overrun at times, as you've said, in your respective hospital settings. I'm just curious just how each one of you are doing. Um, I hope that Bud has the same answer. I am, <laughs> I think we're doing well, uh, but I'll tell you that we have a lot of support, um, support from our mentors. You know, we know that, um, just like athletes, we have people who continue to mentor us throughout our lives, right? Whether we're in the game or whether we're past the game and, um, and Bud and I have the same, uh, we heard from a mentor yesterday, just checking on us, making sure that things were going well. We rely on our friends they are our team. And so we, we do spend a lot of time during the day using a team-based approach to checking on each other, making sure we're okay. And also just making sure we're treating our patients okay because it's a busy time and you don't want to drop the ball um, at any point. So I think that, uh, I think that our, I've learned that from college athletics. It's been an incredible experience this last year to be involved with the SEC because that team-based approach is something I've taken back into the hospital and, and really, um, really applaud them for teaching something to the medical professionals, which is that, you know, it, the stronger you are as a team, the more you support yourself, the more we support our athletes through this, because this is confusing. Uh, I think the better mental health we all have. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that we're doing well because I think that um, I, I think that we're surrounded by good and, and we have a we have a strong team. You know, I'm an ICU doctor and we have, uh, you know, in my opinion, I think some of the most dedicated nurses and nursing staff, uh, the EVS people, the people who come in and clean a room, uh, you, you know, after one patient leaves and another patient's coming, you know, they're everybody's putting their themselves, uh, you know, out. There. I mean, they're they're exposed to this, too. You know, they are they are in the thick of it uh, and, and they're and they're doing it. I'll tell you for us, for for the, the doctors in my specialty, what what hurts us the most, and, and it's this isn't unique to COVID. This, I think if you talk to intensivists uh, around the country, we all have the same answer, but we all love the science. We love the physiology. We love cr caring for the critically ill. The one part of our job that that is most difficult is conversations about death and dying, because that is just unfortunately part of being an ICU doctor. Um, to me, what what COVID has, especially now that we have, uh, you know, available vaccines and things, when you when you see needless death and dying, where it's, uh, you know, be it trauma that shouldn't have happened from an accident or, you know, uh, some some illness that could have been prevented. But when I have, you know, 40 year old parents and, and we're having to explain to teenage children and teenage children are having to help make decisions about these things, I, it, we just shouldn't be we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be doing this. And I think that for us, uh, for the nurses, for the respiratory therapists, uh, these are the things that we don't want to be doing. And, and I think that that's the part that really wears on us. And, and, and we are such a, a peripheral thing, you know, just imagine what those families go through at that point. And, and that's why I ask people, if you don't do it for yourself, do it, do it for somebody else. You know, we're, I, I always use the, the, uh, the, the example of, of World War II, you know, these were 18 to 24 year old men who, who stormed a beach taking bullets to, to do something for the greater good. And what we're asking is, you know, uh, take a vaccination um, that is ultra low risk, uh, you know, wear a mask, you know, do just do the right thing. Let's let's get past this. And we're going to get past this as a population of Amer as Americans, as 
as members of this global community, we're not going to get past this as a whole bunch of individuals because that's not how we're going to win this game. Um, and that's one of the things that as I've watched Katie interacting with the teams, it's the team based approach that that I think we miss a little bit in society right now. And that's where I think that we could draw uh, from from the athletics teams is is we're part of we're all a team. We're part of this together. And that's the only way we're going to win this game. So, Brian, and then Katie, if you could comment on the back end, the student athletes that, you know, for lack of a better term, may be feeling a little PTSD here because they might felt like, God, last year was hell. And, you know, got through it. And now we're okay. We don't have to wear a mask. We're not going to get tested. Da, da. And then, whoa, okay, even for vaccinated, maybe that school X, you know, is now a mask mandate. What does that mean for travel and all these kinds of things? And they all come flooding back to them, that anxiety, that fear. What's your advice for those student athletes, Brian? And then Katie on the back end, please. Well, some of the advice is, is evidence-based. You know, we, we got through the winter and spring championships, 87 altogether, when we were still in the thick of the pandemic and we did it successfully and safely. We know so much more now than we did before. And, and yes, there's uncertainty and, you know, why is Delta variant coming and what does it bring? But I think the student athletes have a bit more certainty right now. They know about the vaccine. They know that masks work and they want to compete. We, you know, all of us athletes, you know, when, when we're faced with the possibility of competition, that's what we want to do. That's what we're trained to do. And so it is difficult and it, it is a setback, but, but I think it's very different than when we were, you know, back in March of 2020, we just canceled everything and we had no idea what we were dealing with. So the certainty is what athletes like, it's what they thrive on. And so I think that's, that's a bit more helpful right now. I agree. I, um, I think last year, some of that anxiety is because we were very honest that we didn't know what was gonna happen. We were making a plan as we went along, unsure if, uh, you know, in a week we're going to give you another testing plan, another game canceled. That, that created a lot of anxiety for all of us. And this year, what we can at least provide is a much better game plan. Uh, we understand this virus to the degree that we can, but we understand testing and we have it, which was something we did not have at this time last year. We know how to seat people. We know how to avoid it. Even though it may be anxiety provoking to say I have to mask again, I know that that actually works. So it, most athletes, when I talk to them, they want to play and they want to win. And now I know how to get them to play and winning is up to them. And they, it always was, and they can take that ball and go. So if I can get them to the game and we can, then that anxiety falls off. Um, whether we have to continue to follow some rules or not, they're not worried about that. It, they're happy to follow rules if we can ensure that they'll play the game. And I think the vaccine just kind of sealed the deal for us. All right, last uh, go around here. Brian, what's the, the key thing that you want coaches, administrators, players, school presidents, those that will be watching this to really get out of these new fall guidelines as we go into a little bit of uncertainty of, of where we are on the Delta variant as the weeks progress in August? I'll, I'll be very brief. We provided a playbook, please follow it. But I would say just the same thing. We're, we're a team, you know, let's, let's play this as a team sport. Let's, let's do what we have to do for the team. Um, and I think that that's a lot of things. I think that that's, that's vaccination, that's masking when we need to. Uh, if we do that, if we approach this as a team, as we, if we approach this as a unit, uh, as, as opposed to a bunch of individuals, I really think we can beat this thing. And I really think that, that we can get past it. Uh, I, I never thought that we would be in this for 18 months, but here we are. Uh, but, uh, but I think that with, we have the tools, we just need to use them. And Katie, before you answer, um, it, it feels like one of those tools, the mask, pretty simple. Not that, you know, none of us can just go grab a vaccine or a booster if that ends up happening, but it can be sort of there when you need it. And <laughs> You know, we know that there could be other times, other illnesses where we may need to mask up to prevent spreading it, uh, you know, different forms of the flu, who knows? Um, but how do you sort of send this message off that in the, in the short term, we're in this, in the long term, here's where I hope we could be if you do what you're supposed to, Katie? Oh, absolutely. I think that this is our proudest moment. You know, we each generation sort of looks for, um, am I going to be able to contribute so much that I will redefine the greatest generation? And and when I talk to athletes, that's what I say, because that's how I feel. This is my generation and their generation's proudest moment. People will talk about us 
for years and years to come because we'll end a pandemic. That's never happened before. So get on board, use all the tools in your toolkit. That's the only way that you become the greatest generation is to pull out all the stops. And on the back end of us, we'll laugh, we'll put those tools away. People a hundred years from now may have to pull them out, but when they do, they'll talk about how successful we are. Yeah, the pictures will be in color versus black and white. From That's the right, that's right. Uh, we can't wait for obviously those days. Well, look, as always, anytime I can talk to the three of you, I learned something. I certainly uh, feel better about the day, uh, even though some of the news is you know, obviously a little grim in the short term. Um, Dr. Katie O'Neill, Dr. Bud Hollis, and as always, uh, Dr. Brian Hainline, the NCAA Chief Medical Officer. Thank you so much. And as always, you can go to ncaa.org slash social series, where all our social series are archived. Stay safe, everyone. Get vaccinated. Put your mask on certainly where it is needed and where it is mandated. And we're going to get through this. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.